welcome to the Swing Smarter Monthly Newsletter. This is your host, Joey Myers from HittingPerformanceLab.com. And today I have the honor of, this is actually our first time meeting in person, which Derek and I, this is Derek Mason. So welcome to the show, first of all. Thanks for having me, Joey. This is great. Looking yeah. forward to it. You got it. Yeah. So, so Derek is, and I'm going to let him go into a little bit more on what he does, but Derek takes the middle side of the game. And in particular with these, you know, our, our group, we, we talk about hitting. And so we'll be talking about the mental side of hitting in this, in this program. Uh, but it, what's interesting about Derek is he's, he's up at our, he's our Northern ally up in, in Canada. And any, anytime we can promote Canadians and get Canadians out there, I just showed up on the uh, complete sports podcast. Darren runs that he's a Canadian fellow Canadian. So it was kind of cool. We had a little, we had a little conversation hour and a half and yeah. we talked a lot about some of the challenges with getting more Canadians recruited and playing major league baseball and things like that, you know, like Justin Morneau and some of the uh, Larry Walker, some of the very big ones out there, high name ones. So anytime we can promote Canada, we, we'd love to love to do it. So um, first question, Derek, just give us a little bit of, um, of a background from where you started. You have a great, great story. So go ahead and just kind of give us that elevator pitch there. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Joey. So I'm from North Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, so I've grown up uh, playing fast pitch softball, actually. So pretty unique in that uh, these days, the men's game has uh, has definitely dwindled off and don't see a lot of uh, male participants in the sport anymore. But uh, it is still, you know, still has a, an international competition. And uh, so I grew up playing fast pitch from from five years old, sprinkled a little bit of baseball in there, but um, that's really been my focus. Uh, growing up here, playing on provincial teams, uh, first got notice into the national team conversation around the age of 19 or 20, uh, and made my debut with Team Canada at a Pan American Championship in Mexico in 2006. So I've been with the national team program since then. I've played in four world championships. Uh, I've won a gold medal at a Worlds and three bronze. Uh, also won the Pan Am Games in 2015. So I've been really fortunate to play at the highest level of, of competition in our sport uh, and travel the world playing in Australia and New Zealand a couple of winters down there. Uh, and as well as done some coaching with uh, the Team Canada Women's Olympic team uh, prior to the Beijing, Beijing Olympics of uh, 2008. So, as I said, my international career started around 2006. Uh, 2009 was my first world. And leading into that, uh, just having some uncertainty in my life, coming back from some travel after finishing my university degree, started to experience uh, an anxiety disorder, which really, you know, kind of rocked my, my life, but as well in, in tandem with that, my performance on the field. So I feel like I didn't uh, bring my best self to that 2009 Worlds, which was, which was my first uh, debut at an international major event like that. Um, and from there, uh, brought my play down, brought my quality of life down to the point where for the 2000 uh, 13 worlds, I was actually cut from that team. So that was the first time I'd ever been cut from a ball team in my life um, and kind of faced the crossroads where I had to consider, you know, I'm, I'm 28, 29 at the time. You know, am I happy with having played a worlds and, uh, and kind of move on? Uh, or am I going to sink my teeth into this and figure it out and, and get my game back, get my, get my mental strength, mental capacity back essentially. So uh, I chose the latter, fortunately, um, continued to educate myself with, you know, quality coaching and counseling on that side, uh, really sunk my teeth into different areas around the psychology of, of sport and of life. But uh, so learning about sports psychology, uh, dedicating myself to uh, mindfulness meditation practice. And, you know, for me as a, as a jock coming up, that like when it was first introduced to me, it was like, wow, this is like for monks in the Himalayas or dudes wearing robes off in the Alps or something like that. Like, this is not me. Uh, but I read Phil Jackson's book, 11 Rings, and he spoke a lot about, you know, how we brought the Zen tradition, but more so just it's a focused practice to the Bulls and to the Lakers of the, of the 90s and early 2000s. And being a, 
an athlete. I really connected with that. Followed that up by reading George Mumford's book, The Mindful Athlete. Uh, again, just seeing how, how to see the mind from a different perspective and better understand what it's doing, why it's doing, especially when you're struggling, uh, when you're facing all sorts of challenging thoughts or, or tense feelings and stuff like that, how to navigate through that and rather than fight against it, but uh, work through it and be able to put it aside and focus exactly in that, that moment where you need to be. Uh, so I got back on the team in 2014. Uh, my play had much, much improved. Regained my starting spot for 2015 for the World Championship win and the Pan Am Games win. Uh, and since then, I've played in, in two worlds. I've continued to broaden my knowledge in this area. And I've always wanted to share this information with, with individuals or young athletes who are coming up. And A, they may be experiencing similar challenges. Or B, they're just looking to get their game to that next level by, by strengthening uh, their mental skills. So um, rather than taking the one-to-one -one consulting approach, uh, I've developed an online mental training program, which is a six-week daily guided program for athletes and coaches to follow, uh, which follows the path of uh, short two to four minute audio lessons with some video lessons mixed in and some exercises each day to a start by just better understanding how the mind works, introducing some of those focus practices that uh, it's just like learning any other skill where, you know, we're trying to adjust our swing in a particular way or learn to hit an off speed pitch. We, we have to do repetition and work on drills and stuff like that. It, these are skills. They can be taught and they can be learned. So working through, uh, through exercises in, in that sense, taking it from these practices outside of the game and bringing them onto the field and how we can incorporate those into building more presence and, and focus into our, into our game, looking at how to deal with those challenging thoughts and thought patterns that, uh, that creep up for all of us. And, and sometimes they just take up too much real estate in our head and, and inhibits our ability to focus. And then looking at some common obstacles like fear of failure, uh, fear of what others are thinking. Uh, how do we approach being in a slump and how, how can we work our way through that mentally to, uh, to get through uh, successfully? So it's been a passion of mine to, to talk about this, to, to teach others and uh, get, gaining some great traction in uh, both the baseball and fast pitch side of things to uh, have, it's a, it's a unique opportunity for an individual to go through, but also I'm getting a lot of teams it's a kind of, it's a cool uh, team bonding experience that they can uh, collaborate for. Cool, Derek. Yeah, <clears throat> you shared a lot of info and we'll, we'll deep dive into, into some of that. So I, I love that. And I wanted to start with, uh, if you don't mind, mind me asking, so you mentioned an anxiety disorder and I know you did uh, that you were going through. If, if you don't mind, um, I understand if, if you don't, but I'm sure there's plenty out there, like you said, that are probably dealing with the same thing. If you can go into maybe a little bit more detail what that was for you. Mm -hmm. And then uh, maybe what are, do you see some of the challenges, maybe the top two when it comes to those different anxiety disorders, thank you to the 2020 stuff. So maybe what you, what you had to deal with a little bit more in depth and then maybe how you, how you got out of that, what was the aha moment? And then maybe what you see the top two things from 2020 that are going to come up. Yeah. So um, as far as my experience with it, um, and, you know, like you say, it is, is kind of different for, for a lot of individuals who experience this. And unfortunately they say this is the most anxious generation to date. Um, so for me, it was, uh, I had some insomnia troubles, uh, which goes without saying is, is going to affect your performance as far as being sharp and, and just, uh, where your mind is. Um, and just kind of overall, uh, with that, the line of thinking that I was under, it was creating a lot of tension in my body. So um, definitely didn't have that relaxation feel to be able to come onto the field and, and just let it flow. Um, a lot of worry type thinking that was quite pervasive. And I think the biggest thing that I realized over time was um, 
was fighting against those those types of feelings and those thoughts. So what I mean by that is for any individual, if you were just, just to pause and it's quiet and just try and listen to the sounds for a second, within about half a second, one, two seconds, a thought's just going to pop into your head. Mm-hmm. Whether it's um, what you got to do next, uh, maybe it's uh, something silly, uh, or if your mind's stuck in this habit of negative pervasive thoughts, it may be something that's self-critical or uh, judging against yourself. And so the realization that you know these thoughts that just pop into our heads, we don't really have any control over that. They're called automatic thoughts. And when they're negative, they call them automatic negative thoughts or ants for short. Mm. So the realization that, okay, I don't have any control over this. If I'm, if I'm beating myself up over these thoughts popping into my head, or if my body feeling tense for a particular reason, I'm really just kind of adding to the tension and angst within my mind or within my body. So by understanding that, okay, those are automatic. It's based off of however my, my, my previous experiences or maybe some, some hardships I've, I've undergone in, in previous years. But if I don't fight those and don't give my mind the, the uh, trigger that, that is saying, that's bad, I need to fight against that. Essentially, the mind is saying, oh, you gave me some attention? I, I'll send some more of those types of thoughts. That's good. Okay. <laughs> But if we kind of just notice it and let it go, over time, the mind figures out that, okay, maybe these aren't very useful type thoughts. I don't need to keep sending the thought that, uh, what if I strike out, everyone's going to laugh at me? Or, um, you know, who's in the stands? Are there scouts in the crowd or anything like that? Whereby um, we can let those go and stop fighting against those. Um, And the other thing is learning how to actually become present on the field. Um, When I was first introduced to um, mental training when it comes to sport, it it was often said, you know, you gotta be fully present. You gotta be fully present on the field. And I kind of took that to be like, okay, well, the the game is two or three hours long. I gotta be focused for two or three hours. Well, that's just not how the mind is made. The mind is made to focus in short stints and then wander off. And then we just learn to notice that and then bring it back gently. And wanders, it comes back. Wanders come back. Um, so to understand a how why the mind does that, but also b how do we bring it back? And we can do that by utilizing our senses. So if that's on the field, rather than thinking about the ball we threw away two innings ago, we can notice that our mind's gone off there, and I can reconnect with my breath. I can reconnect with the feeling of the dirt under my cleats. Um, connecting with our senses. It, they are inherently present. You can't hear something 10 minutes ago. Uh, you can't taste something two days from now. Uh, mm-hmm. They happen right now. So by connecting with those senses, you're able to bring yourself back to the present moment and uh, and better just let go of those, those challenging thoughts. Very cool. I, I love that. <clears throat> and that was one thing I, I was at Headspace, the Headspace app. And in there, I learned, I did that for a couple of years and, and learned that whole idea of you don't fight the, you don't fight the thought if, you know, when it's negative, you, the natural tendency is to say, that's, that's ridiculous. That's not true. And like you said, it's almost like the mind goes, oh, there's some attention. Let's, let's do more of that. Right. So I have a hitter. I have a young online hitter right now, fairly young, and he is a hard worker. And for his age, he's got a black belt. I think it's in Taekwondo and which is pretty impressive. But the, the swing, he seems to be having a hard time putting a lot of pressure on himself to, in the next month, I better do well or else I'm going to quit. And mm-hmm. he puts his hard work, he puts his work in. I mean, he's working half hour a day. And I usually recommend to my hitters at least five minutes a day, four days a week. I don't say thousands of swings and all that kind of stuff because you know how it is with some players. They just, they, they shut off. They're like, I'm not doing that. And we try and start short so this player is actually on the other side of the spectrum where i have to almost tell him to take days off and for his age it's it's pretty crazy so he puts a lot of pressure on himself what's your what's your advice to a a young player like that that is putting a lot of pressure on themselves and is almost giving himself deadlines and if this doesn't happen and we're talking about hitting here right which hitting is a is a very challenging skill in probably arguably any sport you could probably agree with me on that 
um, yeah. you know, maybe more so than pitching. So what advice would you give him? Yeah, when it comes to better understanding that belief system that he's he's working through. So um, essentially what he's his mind is telling him is uh, if if I don't get this by next month or if I'm not the best, then what's the point? Mm-hmm. You, know, you, you kind of have to dig a little deeper into into the thought patterns and understand where they're coming from. And potentially it is to that root belief of I got to be the best or or it's not even worth it. Mm-hmm. And so we kind of peel back the, the layers of the onion to get to that core belief that is pervasive, that is coming through and breaking that apart a little bit, almost how a lawyer would break it down very objectively that, okay, let's, let's look at that, that belief of if I'm not the best, I'm, it's not even worth it. Okay, let's look at that. How many, how many people are the best hitter in the world? Okay, well, there, there's only going to be one. And there's a lot of other hitters in the world. <laughs> um, two, it's very objective as to what is the best hitter in the world. Um, so breaking it down and being able to see that, okay, there's this belief that has built up. It's not necessarily true. And now every time he sees a thought along those lines of, okay, I have to get it done by next month, he could step back and go, ah, you know what? That's, that's not actually true. Just because my mind tells me that, it doesn't mean it's true. And so what we do in the program is work through uh, developing some affirmations uh, against that. So rather than letting the mind continue to uh, tell you that I have to get this done next month or there's no point, could uh, create an affirmation in the opposite effect as far as, you know, I'm working hard and I'm improving every day and my skills are going to develop over time. So rather than having a strict schedule towards it, softening that approach, like we, we talk about a double-edged sword sometimes where we need that drive to, to push us, to put in the work, to practice. Otherwise, you know, we're going to be on the couch and, and not working on our skills. But the other side of that sword is, is pushing ourselves too hard, um, putting too much mental strain on. Um, and so I think understanding that just because your mind tells you something, it doesn't mean it's true, that you can challenge that and plug in some more, some affirmations that work more in your favor, as opposed to just going with whatever your mind tells you. I love that. Yeah. Thank you, Derek, for that. And on the opposite side. So I, so this particular hitter is more of a, I don't want to call them an anomaly because it's not like it's super rare, but there are hitters that work too, almost too hard. I was one of those. And I learned throughout my career that I had to take time off. And when I was really frustrated or I was really just disappointed in my play that I would skip out on the extra BP or I would come to the ballpark. I wouldn't come early like I would before to try and put some extra work in and I would take those breaks. So how about the hitter on the other side, some of those parents out there, they, I get emails and if I put out surveys, they'll say the biggest frustration is actually getting their kid, boy or girl, to actually do the work. So Mm -hmm. on the inspirational side or motivational side, what's your advice for those, those parents working with those, those kiddos? Yeah. um, It, again, that, that is a tough one because Usually, usually when you see athletes who rise to the top of their to, of their group of their sport that sort of thing a lot of that is intrinsically motivated they are the ones who want to go to practice they are the ones who want to put in that work so um when it, especially when it comes to youth sports i'm very much an advocate of focusing on the fun aspect of it, not, not focusing on uh, what could be with college scholarships or what could be with pros. If, if you just listen to me uh, in that uh, uh, essence, you, you can turn off a kid by, by pushing them too hard. If it's, if it's just not theirs, but by focusing more on the fun element and uh, letting them figure out what drives them to play the sport that's going to be much more long lasting than just going to batting practice because mom or dad 
told me to, or mm -hmm. I, because it's a chore. Um, I think it has to come uh, from that joy of the sport and lessening that pressure, uh, understanding that maybe they're avoiding doing extra work because um, maybe there's some fear involved that they might not be living up to some expectations that we may or may not be know that we're, we're putting on the kids. So again, coming back to the fun and, and taking that pressure off that let it be, let it be their, their drive to do it. Great advice. And I think that worked both ways from the hitter that's not as inspired and the hitter that's almost overly inspired. I think that fun element and relationship is, is a big, big thing though. So that's, that's great advice. Um, on the hitting side, you mentioned slumps. And so what do you, what's your, what's your advice when it comes to hitters that are in slumps? And I mean, a slump is like you said, objective. It could be a 0 for 30. It could be an 0 for 10, 0 for 5. It just means whatever slump is to the, to the hitter. What are some of the things, maybe the top two things that you recommend that they do to, to help them transition out of it? Yeah. So first thing is having that perspective of, you know, you talk about 0 for 30, 0 for 10, whatever it is. Uh, typically, you know, in a season, you're going to have four to 700 at bats or something like that. That uh, it's a it's a small segment uh, of that entire season of your entire career, and you also probably have been through a slump previously, and it did come to an end. Uh, sometimes when we're in slumps, we we figure you know there's no way out of this, but mm. understanding that this is that you're in it right now. Uh, forcing your way out of it isn't the way. Um, the other thing I like to think of is when we're, when we think of bringing a slump with us to the plate, we're carrying that baggage of that 0 for 10 up to the plate. But when we're up there, we can't do anything about those previous at-bats. They've already happened. So essentially, as much as we can, bringing that zero for zero mentality to the plate, that this is a brand new opportunity, brand new approach, uh, and as much as we can bring that presence practice to, onto the field. So what I mean by that is the mind is going to revert back. You're going to be on deck going, I, it's going to say to you, you know, you're over 10 and you need to get a hit here. You got to bust out. We can notice that, that our mind is trying to do that. We don't have to necessarily just go with that. Notice it, let go, get back into the feel of our swing, get back into the dirt, feeling under our feet get extremely present and break it down very, uh, very uh, individually like that, sense to sense, step to step, get into the box and then break it down into what I call, you know, what's your, your what's real moment. So as opposed to thinking uh, three pitches ahead and you know, if, he, if he paints the outside corner with this, I got to be ready for a down and in, everything like that, breaking it down to what's real. I'm standing here with a bat the pitcher's out there with a the ball. And my best chance here is to rely on my natural abilities and to just re uh, rely on your reaction and instinct rather than thinking your way through the at-bat, rely on your instinct and just let your talents flow. That's a great one. Yeah, relying on your instinct. Usually I would, because I was more of a thinker, and it would usually get me in trouble. It was a blessing and a curse, right? It right. helped me to think ahead and, and do things ahead of the ahead of the game, be ahead of the other mm -hmm. team. But it also, especially in times of slumps, you tend to overthink and overanalyze. And I used to look at some of the my teammates who seemed to be like cavemen more than over you know overthinkers. And I used to just think, you know what? I wish I could I could be like Brian Moore. I wish I could think like him, where it's you have the attention span of a gnat where something's in front of your face. And once it's gone it, you forget all about it, I, I wish at some point that it's good to do that. So I like how you, you gave that bit of advice before we get to a little bit more of, of what you're doing. I know you touched on it a little bit on your programming mm -hmm. and stuff and, and we'll ask people where, or ask you where people can find you. One of the, th one of the questions I had when you talked about that, you pretty much transitioned out of that anxiety of insomnia and you mentioned a few things. You missed, I think you mentioned meditation and, and trying to be in the more present moment. What, what were the, maybe the one big thing or was it a few of those factors that helped you to, to break out of that? Was there one thing that really transitioned you out and some of the other things helped you up to climb up that ladder or was it just a, a group of different things? And what were they? Yeah, I think the biggest thing for me and whether it's achieved through meditation or um, just 
for me, it was meditation. Others, it can be just a, just a realization and, and more presence of, of mind of having that separation between mind and self. So understanding, and you know, there is a reason that headspace is, be, is called headspace, mm-hmm. uh, is being able to see the mind doing, its, doing what it does separate from uh, myself. So what I mean by that is my mind may tell me that um, well, having got a hit off this picture in, in six tries and, uh, you know, I don't want to look like a fool today. And, you know, I know there's some scouts in the crowd. And then the mind may be doing all this and essentially understanding why the mind is doing that. It's, it's trying to protect us. It's trying to prepare. Uh, it's, it goes way back to uh, how the human brain has evolved over time to uh, protect us and keep the species alive. Uh, it's always kind of looking out for us. So it'll ping these thoughts. And over time, if we give those thoughts a lot of attention, like we said, it's going to keep keep spiraling. But to be able to understand that, okay, that's just the mind trying to protect me. I can put that aside. And like, like we said, bring our presence to the field and let our natural abilities flow as much as possible. When I was in having my hardest times, it was that overthinking state of getting into the box and trying to predict what what the next pitch was at the same time as uh, trying trying not to uh, whether it was built up in in the mind of uh, don't embarrass yourself here or don't waste your at bat because you know you're you're supposed to be a supposed to be this type of player um, and getting caught up in all those habitual thoughts, being able to separate from those and go, all right, that's just the mind doing its thing. I don't have to buy into those. I can let go and just be with what's here. It's me. I'm on a ball field. I got a bat. There's a pitcher with the ball. Let's do this. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. That's the, that's the old, when my hitters, we work mechanical stuff and I tell them there's certain things that we work with that, you can bring to the field today you can so we talk about something like finger pressure where it's just squeezing tight but it's nothing like some of the other things we teach where it's a little bit more cognitive load and we tell them when you get into the box all you're thinking about is just competing and i think that's basically what you're saying is work based off instinct so you have to trust the work that you put in outside of the box and once you get in like you said it's just you got a bat in your hand you got a guy that's got a ball and you're not even really paying attention. That's the other thing that causes anxiety is you think, well, this guy is, man, he's one of those above average velocity guys and he's really good. He's being scouted. He's being, he's, he's verbal to a, a big time college school and all that. And we get, like you said, it's that forward, that f- future thinking, or we're bringing past in and it just becomes so heavy that it almost paralyzes you. Um, very good. Awesome. So I want to be respectful of your time. So Derek, what, uh, you know, you talked a little bit about what your product is and, and, and what mm-hmm. you're doing, explain, uh, just a little bit about a little bit more about what the product is and the, the walk us through that, uh, where we can find you website, any kind of social media, YouTube, all that kind of stuff. For sure. Yeah. So the program is called, uh, the locked in mental training program. It can be found at locked in mental training.com. So, uh, it's a six week daily guided online program that uh, users access through uh, whatever device, typically a a mobile phone. Uh, Each day, users will have a two to four minute audio lesson, uh, along with some daily guided uh, exercises to uh, run through each day to reinforce the learnings. Uh, It's rather than just kind of passively sitting back and listening to something and thinking that it's going to be absorbed. Again, we uh, this is a skill and it has to be practiced. So each day, about five, 10 minutes of, uh, of practice, which varies between uh, some focus practice to bringing some more presence into your day. Um, I like to talk about how the mind itself, we're not just training it to be a better ball player because we bring our mind everywhere we go. So this training, it's, it's training for life skills, better presence as, as an athlete, as, as a uh, student, as, as a inner relationships or career. Um, with those uh, exercises, so there's focus practices, some journal exercise um, uh, exercises to do to 
break down some of those thought patterns to, to better understand how to work through those challenging thoughts. And so over those six weeks, uh, students often uh, come back to me saying you know, they have a much better attention to where their mind is at, at any particular time. And as opposed to just running off with some of those more challenging thought patterns, uh, coaches enjoy it because you know, we all know the mental game is, is a huge part of, of sports. And, but the hard part is to how do we bring that in a program, in a, in a guided process to athletes. A lot of times we bring in a guest speaker or say, here, read this book, uh, but that's, that's the end of it. This is a guided day-by-day -day process that builds up through an understanding of how the mind works and specific exercises that we can bring onto the field of play to, uh, to make us, get us in that great mindset to be present and, uh, and ready to compete. Uh, so again, locked in mental training, uh, dot com. Uh, you can find me on social at uh, Locked in Mental Training on Facebook and Instagram at Derek Mason on Twitter. And uh, yeah, I'd love to talk to some coaches or players out there about, about the mental game or, or setting it up for their team for a cool uh, team bonding experience. Cool. Well, thank you for your time, Derek. And again, like I said, this is hitting the mental side of it or just even playing in general. And I love how you, how you transition to that's not just baseball or softball that you're learning, but it's you're learning life through baseball and softball. And, and I'm all about that. And anybody that can put something together that's going to help both of those two things and not just the baseball, softball, because someday the, that career will end, whether that's going to be after Little League or high school, college or professional or mm -hmm. Olympics at some point that career is going to end and you got to have those skills. You develop those skills to be able to apply to life where, wherever that takes them. So I appreciate mm -hmm. your message, Derek. And then um, we'll, I'll get everything together for you. Send that over and then you can do with it how you will, but thanks again for your time, brother. Glad to. Yeah. Love what you're doing, Joey. And uh, yeah, let me know how, how you want to continue to connect in the, in the future. You got it, Derek. Hey, keep up the good work up there in our Northern, Northern border. You got it, man. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right, brother. We'll see you. Yeah. Take care.